Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. <laughs> it's a truly happy duty uh, to welcome you all on behalf of uh, Grand Valley State University and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences to the 41st Great Lakes History Conference on the theme of revolution, reform, and rebellion. A special welcome and congratulations to the MCHE award winners, Mr. Brood, Mr. Salsaccioli, Ms. Davis, I salute I think congratulations are also due to this year's conference organizers, Professor Yose Wang Di and uh, Professor Gordon Andrews, who's disappeared off to my left there, the success of whose choices have been reflected in the full sessions that uh, I happened to buy a couple times today. In, in far richer opportunities for our students to participate in the conference. What a great way to exemplify the character of Grand Valley. The GLHC is, for us, a high moment in every year. And I hope our history department continues to accept the burdens of organizing it until, well, until we are all history. <laughs> I don't know if the columnist David Brooks strikes you as he does me. So often as with his recent book, The Road to Character, I want to say, nice try, almost, keep trying. I had this response uh, to a recent column in which he argued that the humanities need to address the issues of the next decade of the lives of our students. Well, okay, almost. This is true enough as far as it goes, though if they survive that decade, it's not clear what they should do after that. Um, if that's the whole story, it's too narrow a view. What's needed is a thoroughgoing acquaintance with history's way of knowing. Wicked problems and rapid change call on us to know how to think, how to think when awash in complex context, as historians do. We need to see the value in pattern recognition, the drivers of change, the continuity between events, the meaning of change over time, and the role of agency and memory in human understanding. I know, I know it's a controversial and courageous stand I'm taking, advocating the value of history to students <laughs> of history. But here I stand, I can do no other. Well, I can do a little more. I can introduce a scholar who exemplifies the value of historical thinking, Dr. Fritz Fisher of the University of Northern Colorado. Dr. Fisher received his doctorate from Northwestern in 1994 and has taught at Northern Colorado pretty much since then. His eminently readable and insightful book making them like us, Peace Corps volunteers in the 1960s, was followed more recently by a book I suspect not entirely unrelated to his topic tonight, The Memory Hole, the U.S. History Curriculum 
under siege. Aside from these books and a raft of diverse articles, he has also twice been recognized for distinguished service and twice for distinguished teaching. He's a distinguished guy. Tonight is a topic promises to exemplify the value of history's way of knowing particularly well. Teaching revolution, reform, and rebellion, and those who want to prevent it, I only wish David Brooks could be here to learn from it, but I'm happy I am, and I know you will be glad you are. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Fritz Fisch. Thank you very much. That was a fun introduction. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, thanks especially to um, Grand Valley State and to the Michigan Council for History Education. I'm not sure how many of you realize how difficult it is to or uh, organize such a conference. And just a little plug for MCHE. I, Personally, I've been on the uh, board of directors of the National Council for History Education for uh, almost 15 years now. I was the chair for five years. Spent a lot of time um, organizing conferences, uh, national conferences, and it's a really quite a task to organize such conferences. And I will give you a little plug, a little plug for um, going to the National Council for History Education's conference, which is going to be at uh, Niagara Falls in late April. Um, there's still about a week to submit proposals for anybody who's interested. Um, one of the strengths of MCHE and NCHE is that um, it brings together practitioners of the teaching of history at all levels, whether it's somebody at the university level, the elementary level, middle school level, high school level. So especially I wanna encourage award winners there's still a week to put in a proposal. We love having teachers. Most of the uh, sessions are actually teachers from all over the country, and it's a great way to meet people. There's also a student rate for those students who might be interested in a really powerful uh, experience of professional development. So especially if you've never seen Niagara Falls, we're hoping that the third week in April it will be a little bit warmer than it might otherwise be. Um, but. Uh, and it's probably warmer than here, the third week in April. Um, feel free to uh, take a look at that online. Um, so I will, uh, I'm hoping to keep my remarks um, somewhat truncated today. So I really want to have some give and take, answer some questions, talk a little bit uh, about the book. Um, but I'm going to start out with a little game. Now, um, for those large numbers of you who've, prob who've read the book already, um, and have already seen this game played, I, you can't play. But if you haven't played this game before, um, feel free to participate. All right. What is the very first most basic thing you notice about what you see on the screen there? You can s call it out. Numbers. Numbers. Okay. That's actually very good and interesting. It's not usually the first thing I hear in an audience such as this. What's the first thing most of you thought? Dates. Dates, okay. One of the, one place I'd like to begin is the fact that you say dates, you think dates because you're a history nerd. You think in terms of history, okay. For many, this is just a string of numbers, okay. Um, for a bunch of first graders, it's a string of numbers. Probably a bunch of third graders. Uh, it is a, one of the basic tools of the historian that these actually mean something. Okay, so they're dates. We're starting to think historically. Does any date jump out at you? or? Some of the dates. Who's got a date that they see that they think they recognize? 1776. 1776. Why do we recognize that? Declaration. Declaration of Independence. Good. Any other dates we recognize? 
Okay, Lexington and Concord, 1775. Good. 1941, Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, 1941. Any others that jump out at you? 2001. Okay, the um, attack on the World Trade Center. 1969, man steps on the moon. Okay, interesting. So, this is another aspect of historical thinking. We ascribe meaning to particular dates. We ascribe meaning to particular events. This, again, is not something that's necessarily natural. We've been trained to think this way. And by the way, when I use the term history nerd, it's a term of endearment. Be proud of it, embrace it, love it. That's who we are. All right. Anything else? Is there any sort of pattern? So I'm, I'm leading you a little bit here. All right, let's keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to give you a hint and suggest that there are, there is a pattern. There's two patterns. We're going to read it by row. So the top, there's a top row pattern and a bottom row pattern. Okay. So let's stick with the top row. We've got Declaration of Independence. 1789. Anybody know what the significance of the, and I will say I'm an American historian, so we're going to focus on American history. So French Revolution uh, actually does apply somewhat to American history, but there's a more important reason. For, okay, so the con ratification of the Constitution, written in 1787, finally ratified in 1789. 1863, Emancipation. Emancipation Proclamation. Good. So we're really good history nerds. Usually somebody says something about the Civil War, but we we're kind of getting it. 1941, Pearl Harbor. 1964, Civil Rights Act. Civil Rights Act. 2001, it was the Trade Center. Okay. Can we do anything with those numbers together? What is that if we think of the numbers together? It is a timeline at a very basic level. So again, another tool for historical thinking. I think it's more than just a timeline, though. Yeah? A timeline of turning points OK, a timeline of turning points and policies. I, say, I would suggest maybe it's more than that. Is there a story there or an argument? What might be the story or the argument in that line? Who's got some guesses? Yeah? Okay, unification of the country, crossing line. How is the country, what unifies the country? Are there an, is there an ideal implicit in the unification of the country there? Patriotism. Patriotism. Good. Any other words that come to mind? Crisis. The crisis that initiated that, those changes. The crisis initiated it, but this is the reaction to the crisis. Is there an idea or a set of ideas? How about liberty, equality, these ideas that some would argue are America, that many might argue, or even before 1960, this is the story of America. This might have been the only story of America students got in school at a particular time. And as I'm going to discuss, some still say this is the only story of America. All right, let's go to the second line. We do have Lexington and Concord. That was correct. Wow, 1831. Oh, bravo, Nat Turner's Rebellion. That's exactly what that is. All right, 1886. Who said Haymarket? See, he. Are you a professor? All right. He's an expert history nerd. <laughs> he knows where I'm going. There's going to be a story. There's going to be an argument. These two things are aspects of historical thinking. 
they don't come naturally to the uninitiated. They come perhaps all too naturally to the over-initiated. Okay? So, yes, Haymarket Square, 1913. Okay, model, model T assembly line could be, but it doesn't fit this story. I think Ludlow was a little earlier. I'd have to place that. That's interesting. Actually designates the original founding of something called the National Woman's Party, okay, which were the radical um, suffragists who were going to take no compromise in getting the vote for women. Now. 1969, we earlier heard, was the landing on the moon. It could also be Woodstock, it, but it is, in this story, Stonewall. What's Stonewall? Stonewall's the rebellion in New York at the uh, gay bar against the oppression of the New York Police Department um, from uh, gays in New York. 2014. In this story, what do you suppose 2014 is? Ferguson. It's Ferguson. Now, maybe it's a little gratuitous that I put it in there because we don't have as much context or background or enough time to really see that this is going to fit necessarily in this story. But I would argue it fits well in this story. So what is this the story of? Revolution, reform, and rebellion. Okay. Yes, conflict, but particular conflicts. Perhaps people who didn't feel like they fit in the first story, trying to muscle their way into that, being part of that first story. All right? My, one of my, so one of the purposes in doing this number puzzle, as I call it, is to exemplify what historical thinking is, at least in part, in a, in a sort of cute, thought-provoking way. Get people involved in my talk to start with. And the idea is that uh, we, as his history nerds, um, think in a particular way. And it's incumbent upon us to help our students think in that way as well. That's one of our tasks. And this is what I, I've, I've worked at uh, the University of Northern Colorado. I have a job very similar to, to Gordon's, for example. I'm working with both in the history department and with future teachers. Um, done it for about 20 years. Before that, I taught in high school and middle school. And um, this is the, the focus of what I want to be doing, is to, th is to work with my students on historical thinking. As I've been um, involved in things like the National Council for History Education, I have found, however, that that's not what everybody thinks history is all about. Rather, they think that history is about teaching one of these stories and not the other. And unfortunately, a lot of them I have found in my research when I was researching this book um, really want to force upon future teachers and current teachers um, teaching a particular story. In historical thinking, history is about questions. It's not necessarily about the answers. It's getting to that story, getting to the end, the process of getting to the end, thinking how to think with the past rather than telling only one story from the past. Now, one way to think of this story the first story is that America is a shining city upon a hill. Um, America has, is, and has always been the best, and I purposely use that word, the best country in the world. The one that fosters liberty and democracy and equality more so than any other country in the world. And this is the only way we should teach history. And when it comes to things like rebellion and revolution and reform, well, maybe we shouldn't focus so much on that. Now, of course, it's very ironic because in both stories, is they're born in re revolution. 
Okay, Lexington and Concord's the first part of that story. So, a little bit connected to where I, near where I live. I live in um, northern Colorado, and um, you may have paid attention. Last fall, there was a uh, big controversy in what is the biggest school district in the state of Colorado, 85,000 students. It's Jefferson County. It's suburbs just to the west of Denver. Um, Julie Williams and two other board members were elected to the board with an, uh, a very clear goal on what they wanted to uh, happen in their schools. And a whole variety of different changes they wanted, but one, as it turns out, was to the history curriculum. Um, now, and I don't want to get into too much detail about this, but the uh, advanced placement U.S. history test um, has been under revision for a number of years. They, uh, the folks in the college board who write it um, wrote a new framework for what the history exam should be about. And it, f it focuses more on ideas of historical thinking. But according to some on the school board in Jefferson County and the school board of the state of Texas and the state of Oklahoma and the state of Georgia, the state of Kentucky, the state of Tennessee, I could go on, decided that it was, um, it didn't teach that first story enough. The framework focused not on the first story, but instead focused on historical thinking. And so a school board member, this woman named Julie Williams, said we should not allow the teaching of AP US history in our district anymore. What history needs to be, she argued, the purpose of history is to promote citizenship, patriotism, essentials and benefits of the free enterprise system, respect for authority and respect for individual rights. It should not encourage or condone civil disorder, and it needs to teach the positive aspects of the American past. It needs to teach the first story, and only the first story, she argued. And because there are five school board members and two thought like she did, they um, voted originally to at least examine the AP curriculum, the new AP framework, and with the hope of getting rid of it. Students got wind of this and walked out of class by the hundreds and actually by the thousands and protested. Many months later, finally, the uh, school board dropped the crusade. Um, so they didn't actually end up dropping AP, but it was very instructive that there are some who really would like to. Okay. And this is the kind of thing that a few years earlier uh, brought me to writing this book. Um, and I want to dig into it, two examples of specific times in American history that specific groups want to change. So let's talk about American revolutionaries. Okay. You know, the folks who were at Lexington and Concord, folks who also wrote the Declaration of Independence. So, my first question to Ms. Williams might be, um, is this an image of patriotic exceptionalism? Well, there's a term I haven't um, introduced yet. The idea that the United States is and always has been the best, most perfect, most unblemished country in the world is an idea that's called American exceptionalism. Um, and so the question is, uh, well, what's happening here? Okay, they're tarring and feathering uh, a stamp tax collector, a tax collector in general. Um, it's an act of rebellion, clearly. It's an act of revolution in many ways. And it's not the kind of act that those who want to change the US history curriculum want to be emphasized in the schools. Rather, this is what they want to emphasize, okay? This symbolizes the American Revolution. This symbolizes the founders. Now, this actually has a fascinating story behind it. Another quiz. What do we see here? Who is it? What's he doing? OK, George Washington. We recognize George Washington. What's he doing? He's praying. Now. Um, Interestingly enough, the Library of Congress actually has a wonderful lesson plan, you can, um, you can Google it, um, where they pass this, out, this picture out to a bunch of third graders and ask them to write about it. 
And one wonderful student wrote that this is a man who's in a war, recognized that he had a uniform on, and he's ducking to avoid getting shot. <laughs> Humorous, but actually quite observant. We come at it with context. We think we know the context behind it. We think he's probably praying. But as it turns out, that third grader is just as accurate to the actual historical events as our preconceptions that there was Washington was praying at Valley Forge. Um, this is a lithograph from the 1850s. It's based on one primary source that first appeared in a collection, um, was first written about in a collection uh, by a guy named Parson Weems. Um, this, what did Parson Weems, what, did anybody know what he's most famous for creating? It's the cherry tree story. Parson Weems did the cherry tree story. So not really known for historical accuracy. Um, but he did um, come up with this idea that Washington was praying at Valley Forge in order to, um, uh, from one account by a fellow named Isaac Potts, who said that he saw Washington praying, um, and then he went home and told his wife all about it. You know, to dig a little bit and you find out that Isaac Potts was married 10 years after the event, didn't even know the woman that he said he went and told the story to. Pretty much historians agree that, that any sort of eyewitness account of Washington praying at Very Valley Forge um, is a fabrication. More importantly, most importantly, than arguing about whether this actual event happened, is to argue, to think about what represents the American Revolution more accurately? And what represents George Washington more accurately? Washington scholars agree that there's a very, very low likelihood that Washington would have ever prayed in the open in front of his troops. Washington was a very personal man, so much so that at church, when the um, congregants went up for, uh, to take communion, he left. He never took communion in public. No one ever actually saw him kneel and pray in public. That wasn't the person he was. But there are certain folks in the United States today that want us to believe that the central aspect of the American Revolution, the central aspect of George Washington's character was he was a devout, evangelical Christian in the form of a 21st century evangelical Christian, which is highly not only debatable, but it doesn't jive with any of the primary source documentation about what Washington was all about. Now, I first got into this not with this image, but with this one which is, I'm actually not supposed to show it for very long. I'll show it kind of briefly. Oh, and I can't show it very long. Um, this is an image, anybody seen this image before? Okay, it's an, actually a relatively famous image. It occurs in lots of lesson plans, including in a book by William Bennett, former Secretary of Education. That one, whoops, that one. Um, and um, it's almost in some circles. So for example, if, if you were homeschooled, you certainly would have seen this. It would have been on the cover of your textbook on American history. Um, reaches the level of something like the Washington cross crossing the Delaware, which we all know is problematic in some ways. It teaches us more about the 1850s than it does about the revolution. Oh, can't show it too long. Um, this painting was actually painted, um, anybody have a guess of the year that this was painted? 1976, 1976 by an, an avowedly religious painter who wanted to depict what he thought was the centrality of this idea, this image in the image of Washington and in the idea of the founders, okay? That Washington was bowing his head in obeisance to this all-knowing God. Now, um, the reason I keep going back and forth is um, the painter um, has on 
um, the, his website and in all the materials, the uh, uh, statement that you can never show this image if you are in any way disparaging of the painter or the uh, ideas that the painter wants to get across. So my book actually has this image. I couldn't put this one in my book. I can show it here because there's probably no spies from Arthur Freiburg, Inc. here. Um, but uh, it, it illustrates, and the question becomes, why has this become such a big deal? Why is it in lesson plan after lesson plan and after lesson plan? Why did a former American Secretary of Education make this the centerpiece of his lesson on George Washington? Well, it's all because of this group. It's a group called Wall Builders. Wall Builders is a group founded by a fellow named David Barton, who is, uh, lives in Texas. He's a political activist, actually. And this is what his organization does. They present America's forgotten history. So for example, Washington praying at Valley Forge. That's America's forgotten history. Maybe it's been forgotten because it never happened. Um, and heroes with an emphasis on our moral, religious, and constitutional heritage. The idea behind Wall Builders is to promote the centrality of the idea that Amer the United States is a Judeo-Christian nation. The Enlightenment be damned. We're not going to learn about reason. We're not going to learn about um, anything other than that the central primary source that the founders were interested in was the Bible and the Ten Commandments. That's the basis for the Constitution, according to the Wall Builders. Now, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about textbooks as far as how this gets in the classroom. Um, one way this gets in the classroom is uh, Constitution Day. Who here knows about Constitution Day? All right, Constitution Day is a day where all public institutions are required to have an event or events celebrating the American Constitution. That includes universities, so you probably have to organize some sort of event here at Grand Valley State, and uh, high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools need to do that. What the Wall Builders conveniently does is provide free materials for teachers to present on the Constitution. Teachers love free stuff. Teachers are too busy during the middle of the year to find their own stuff. They give me this free stuff. I then teach about the centrality of the Judeo-Christian heritage to the making of the Constitution. Unfortunately, if this is the only story we tell, we miss some fundamentally important things about the founders and their beliefs. I'm just going to give one example right now. Another founder, Thomas Jefferson. Um, this is a, a primary source that Jefferson created um, that's known now as the Jefferson Bible. It's in the Smithsonian. You notice that there's little things cut out of the Jefferson Bible. Now, can't play if you know the answer. Does anybody have a guess? What did Jefferson cut out of his Bible? Anybody know? Anybody want to guess? He cut out the miracles. So this walking on water thing, oh, reason suggests that couldn't have happened, so it didn't, so I'll cut it out. This whole thing of making lots of fish, a person making a lot of fish, that's doesn't really fit reason, so I'm going to cut it out. Washington really, I mean, Jefferson really respected Jesus Christ as a historical figure and a philosopher, a mentor. But he didn't buy the miracle stuff. Now, I don't want to put necessarily any sort of um, positive or negative spin on it. Looking at the primary sources, this just suggests what happened. We need to try to understand Jefferson and Washington in the context of their time. So context, there's historical thinking. We want to ask questions. OK, was Jefferson an evangelical Christian? Well, it's hard to suggest he was if he's cutting out the miracles. It just doesn't fit. We can't start with answers based on today, on what we want the people of the past to look like, because they fit what I might think today. We don't want to do that. We want, as historians, to see how do they fit in the context of their times. 
yeah, that's kind of weird that Washington didn't take communion. He didn't pray in public, but he did talk a lot about providence and the fact that, well, you know, he was in a, uh, in a battle in the, in the French and Indian War and his shot, horse got shot from under him and he had a lot of bullets in his, in his, uh, uh, in his coat. And he said, well, you know, somebody's protecting me. So I'm not suggesting these are atheists. Well, maybe Jefferson. But they didn't believe like 21st century evangelical Christians is the point. That's not what history should be all about. All right, so there's one example. Let's talk about some rebellion. Um, I'm going to go back to Julie Williams, and you might have noticed in this quote, she talks about, it seems kind of weird the way she puts this, the need to teach the essentials and benefits of the free enterprise system. Again, if you research this, she didn't come up with this. This comes directly out of a set of ideas that come from some websites, that, a whole bunch of websites you can find online. Um, and uh, again, it's a whole philosophy on how to teach American history, what has to belong and what can't belong. And it's based, in fact, on uh, the works of this woman and others like her, Ayn Rand, um, Atlas Shrugged, um, other libertarian ideas, um, I would say ultra-libertarian ideas, on how a free market should be organized and how an economy should be organized, um, completely um, disparaging reform, legislation, for example, or any sort of ideas that anybody but the individual, the free market, should govern an economy. And uh, people that um, argue for this um, have argued that it's really important to get this into the schools. And they have succeeded in many ways. So if you taught in Texas an economics class, this is the title by statute of the economics class in high school in the state of Texas. Economics with an emphasis on the free enterprise system and its benefits. Word for word, exactly what Julie Williams said. The same exact wording. Can't be an accident, and it's not. Okay? So if you're teaching, if you're, now who here are teacher candidates? I think there's a group over here. People who are going to be teachers in the future. Okay? Anybody who's going to be teachers in the future, if you want to go to Texas, you're going to have to kind of think. All right, this is interesting. And this is actually how I originally got involved in this, when Texas wrote their standards um, and invented names for their classes. Um, they were heavily involved in, uh, heavily connected with these sorts of ideas. David Barton, they had three experts evaluate their new standards. David Barton, the one I talked about earlier, was one of them. Uh, none of the people that evaluated their standards were actually PhDs in history. None of them were history teachers. Okay? They were political folk. All right, so what does this mean? And what is, how does it connect with the theme of this conference? Economics with an emphasis on the free enterprise system and its benefits. All right, so if you're a Texas teacher, let's look at late 19th century America. Um, this is sort of a, you know, this is the Monopoly guy. The Monopoly guy is uh, supposed to represent whom in our memory of uh, uh, American history? What was the term that we use to describe the guys that the Monopoly guy is show? Robber barons, okay? So these guys, you know, Vanderbilt and, and uh, you know, Leland Stanford and Mark Hopkins, you know, the guys who built the railroads, uh, you know, Carnegie and Rockefeller, the folks who pretty much ruthlessly, um, successfully and effectively um, were able to um, dominate the American economy in the late 19th century. In Texas, these have to be positive characters. In Texas, the, um, does anybody have a guess Again, I'm going to quiz you again. If this kind of story and this kind of thought, there is one American president between Lincoln and Harding who is a hero to these folks. No? 
Not quite McKinley. McKinley's getting a little too involved. It's Grover Cleveland because he vetoed anything that suggested the, the federal government had a role in regulating the economy. Okay? The arch villain in this story is Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt, who, you know, the Mean Inspection Act, things later like the FDA, any time, the uh, national forests, national parks, the federal government involving itself in the workings of the economy. You have to treat this person as a villain. So it's a world of heroes and villains, of good and bad. And one thing that is consistently ignored is something like this. This is an artistic rendition of the Haymarket Riot. In the Texas curriculum, in the Texas standards, you're not supposed to teach about protest, about the building of unions, about why unions might exist in the first place. You're not supposed to teach about, well, why was it that the Meat Inspection Act was passed? Why was the Meat Inspection Act passed? Quiz, another historical quiz. Anybody can play. Yeah, the jungle. Can't teach that in Texas. He was a socialist. That's even worse. Okay? So I think, as a historian, by limiting the kinds of sources that students are able to engage, it's extraordinarily problematic. By limiting those sources and not allowing students to evaluate what happened themselves, you're not teaching history. You're teaching an argument about the past. History is just one way to understand the past. There are other ways. There's myth, for example. I would think ignoring things like Haymarket, ignoring Homestead, ignoring Ludlow, ignoring some very serious, very powerful events, you shortchange your students, and they don't understand the American past the way they should. <laughs> Now, my book is entitled The Memory Hole, and it's kind of the, my publisher did come up with a kind of cute thing with a little hole in the memory, and that's part of the meaning. But the real memory meaning is connected to George Orwell. Okay? And the fact that the, the lead character in 1984, his job is to take things that actually happened and put them in something they call the memory hole, which is this kind of vacuum tube that would suck up primary sources. Anytime something appeared that the party didn't like, he would uh, find it and put it through the memory hole and we'd be gone forever. So if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past, ran the party slogan, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. All right, so this is, you can get pretty dark. Scary, I think. Now, I don't, I want to be an equal opportunity attacker here and suggest it's not just the right that has failed in this way. This is from a website um, from an avowedly left leaning organization. And they argue history is a weapon. We must seek out the tools we will need. History is just one tool to shape our understanding of our world, and every tool is a weapon if you hold it right. That's not my view of history. In this, again, this is the same sort of idea. We are going to start with an answer. We know we want to get somewhere. We know we want to change the organization of society, as an example. If we want to change the organization of the, of the economy or society, we have to make history work for us, use it as a tool. But that's not what history needs to be about. History is about trying to find, ask questions, trying to find out what really happened. Are we always going to get there? Probably not. But to simply say, we're just going to use it as a tool to get where we want to go is a whole different proposition entirely. All right, so instead of the city, shining city on the hill, 
We have America as the evil empire. I love this thing. This, I found this just in a random website. I think this is great. I'm a big Star Wars guy. so. Um, but we then get things like Christopher Columbus, wanted, grand theft, genocide, racism, rape, torture, destruction of an entire culture. This is behind uh, the, we see this, we're seeing it right now because Columbus Day is coming up on Monday. You know, we, we have to um, get rid of Columbus Day. There might be reasons for that. But for example, let's just take one of those words, genocide. Genocide is the idea of eliminating an entire culture for a political purpose, an entire race for a political purpose. Columbus and the conquistadors that followed him, they didn't want to eliminate that culture. They wanted to use that culture to get rich. One of the arguments for genocide is that, well, all the Native Americans died. Many of them died and it was his fault and the fault of the other conquistadors. Well, the vast majority of Native Americans died. Yes, it was the fault of the Europeans, but they didn't know it was their fault because it was the diseases they brought with them that killed the Native Americans. Money of the, and, and there are later, some, there's some later evidence, three centuries later, two centuries later, that um, some of the uh, diseases were spread on purpose. Certainly not the case in the 16th century because the Europeans had no idea how the diseases spread. They had no clue. So you misunderstand and misrepresent the idea of genocide if you just slap that label on it. Columbus bad genocide. It's overly simplistic. This is from a, a website. Um, there's a, a group that uh, they called Rethinking Schools. And this is from a website about the founders. And instead of emphasizing Washington's religiosity, this website emphasizes the fact that he was a slave owner. And not only a slave owner, a pretty evil slave owner. Now, if we go back to 1950, um, we're going to find very little reference to Washington the slave owner. And that's a problem. It is important when we teach about Washington and the other founders uh, to talk about the centrality of slavery in their world. But to only emphasize that and to not talk about the context of the times, the complexity of the issues, to only say Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, slave owners, evil, next story, is insufficient because it's not trying to get at the complete understanding of who they were. Capitalism, again, bringing you lower quality and fewer choices since the 16th century. Again, a wonderful image. Um, wonderful thing to ask students to evaluate that statement. That would be a really neat exercise. Ask students to talk about what did capitalism bring that was negative and for whom? Was it negative for? Was it positive for others? Let's ask some complex questions rather than saying, this is the answer, let's move on. All right, so we're students and teachers of history. What are we gonna do? How do we find the truth? Can we find the truth? Well, I'm not gonna argue that we can find the truth. Um, most historians would agree that we're never gonna quite get there. We're gonna try. We might never get there. But I think it's in the trying that's the central aspect of how history should be taught. Again, this doesn't come through the way it should when I have it on my computer. Um, what I'm trying to emphasize here is um, when we look in depth at what historical thinking is, that's the answer for teachers. Because a teacher might say, well, what do I do? I can't teach the left because it's incomplete. I can't teach the right because it's incomplete. Maybe I should let my students lead, read a little of the left and a little of the right, and we're come where, somewhere in between, and then they'll have it right. Well, that's wrong. I call that the Sunday talk show version of history. We're gonna have this wacko from the left and this wacko from the right, and voila, we're gonna come to some kind of neat answer in between. 
Well, what if they're both wrong? What if they're both not even starting from the right place? The key is to get our students to start from the right place. And that's to think historically. This comes from the NCHE website. It's the blueprint for student learning. These are a whole series of ideas that I think should be a great guide for teaching a history in the classroom. It should all be, so think analytically and deeply by posing and framing questions, evidence, change over time, et cetera. There's a number of different ways we can find this. These are um, three places. There's a couple books here. The central book in the field is, is the one in the middle, Sam Weinberg's Historical Thinking and Other Unnatural Acts. Um, this is a book uh, by a colleague of mine who actually has been a teacher in Maryland. Why won't you just tell us the answer? Because that's not the point. The point is to ask the questions. Okay? The point is to do this. You ask questions, you find evidence, you try to understand the point of view, you look at who wrote it and why, you try to develop an argument about what happened in the past. You try to analyze the context of the times. I could go on and on. It's, a very, it's actually a very complex idea. It's one that takes a long time to really learn. But I think it's the only answer to avoid these simplistic stories that unfortunately we hear a lot from some of our current political candidates. Even just yesterday, we heard an argument from one of our political candidates um, that was supposedly a historical argument that had no connection to evidence whatsoever. So the key idea is that in our classrooms, whether it's with our graduate students, with our undergraduate students, with our eighth graders, with our fourth graders, we can work with thinking historically. It's also a way to connect all across the span of grades, what we all do, what an eighth grade teacher does, what I do with my undergraduates and my graduate students, with what third grade teachers do. It can all be very similar at a different level. So where is this happening? Where can I learn more? Well, of course, I have to plug my book. Um, in my book, I talk about uh, a number of other examples that you can uh, take a look at of where this is happening, what states it's happening in. It's happening in every state. I'll give you one example. The, if we look, if we thought of uh, the number of students that are um, enrolled in schools at the secondary school level, and we ranked that number. The 15th largest number of secondary school students are actually, uh, if, if we rank one through 52, if I consider DC one of those 50, 50 states plus DC plus this one other entity, number 15 on the list is homeschools. That's the number of kids that are receiving the kind of education that is totally and utterly incomplete and not connected to uh, thinking historically. Okay, so it's happening and again, I published the book early nine, uh, November, it was uh, November 2013. And the whole thing happened just down the road from me with a lot of my former students in Jefferson County six months later in my state. So it's happening everywhere and it's something we need to be aware of and try to agitate against. And it, again, it shouldn't be Republican, it shouldn't be Democrat, it shouldn't be left, it shouldn't be right. Am I political? Well, I have personal political views. And in one way, I am political. I'm political and very passionate that there is a right way to teach history. And it has to do with historical thinking. It's not right or left. It's not conservative or liberal. There are other ways to teach the past. But this is the best way to teach history. So that's it. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Anybody have any questions?